Amen. Good morning. It's uh, great to be here this morning. Before I start, I just want to say, uh, if you didn't know, this weekend was... Did not hear the... There it goes. Okay. Is that working? Okay. This weekend uh, was quite the weekend uh, for our teens. We had our uh, summer end lock-in. And so, first of all, I just want you, whether they're in the auditorium or not, please give a round of applause to all the adults and the people who made that possible. We had a lot of fun, but I continually come back and say, man, being uh, 34 is a lot harder to stay up all night than it was at 18. And I saw how tired they are, and they just don't understand that, man, I'm, I'm every bit that tired. And so I want to apologize this morning. I'm still trying to recover from a wonderful weekend, but I will tell you that it was an awesome weekend. It was an awesome lock-in. We had a lot of fun. We sang, uh, we talked about... We, we, we paused the activities at, at midnight and turned the lights down and put lights out, uh, like can't, the lantern-style lights out, and sang to, uh, worship songs to God. And that was an amazing experience with uh, just amazing uh, voices from our teens. We had most of our youth group there with Dean and Abby, and it just became this really neat moment where we even had a little bit of an emotional moment at the end of, of realizing, hey, this is the end of summer, and, and this is the beginning of, of new things for our youth group, beginning of a transition for Abby and Dean, and also just one year later uh, for our graduates and for those who have moved up. So a really neat experience. Um, I would love to tell you more about it. You should have asked the kids about it. It was a great time. This morning, it, what I want to talk to you about, though, is uh, something that I actually had planned on speaking at uh, Camp PBC. Uh, I was supposed to go. I was supposed to be there that week, but health issues had come up, and I just did not feel comfortable doing so at the time while I still recovered. And so I stayed behind. But what we were doing at camp this, uh, this year as we did the planning is we were wanting to talk about the life of Peter and, and the good and the bad. And then my idea or my, my assignment was to, hey, on a Thursday night, I believe, it was let's talk about how failure in Peter's life did not define him. And that was, that was going to be my topic. And so I'm going to pull that material that I prepared for that and, and, and do that today for our lesson but before I transition into Peter himself, I want to start by saying that uh, several years ago, before we moved to Houston and then eventually moved to here, uh, I worked at a drug and alcohol and other addictions rehab center. Uh, it was in Arkansas. You might know of it. It's called Capstone. Um, Capstone's a really neat program. They do a lot of neat things out there, and that's really one of the inspirations I had for why I'm about to have a licensure in therapy or counseling. But when I was out there, one of the things that struck me was that every day you would have these kids from 13 years old all the way to 28. Most of them were younger, though. Like most of them were 13 and 19. And they would be really tough, hardened kids, right? They would come from, uh, well, inner city Houston, or they would come from Memphis, or they would just be from these rough areas of life, and they had a lot of problems, a lot of resentment, a lot of anger, the crippling addiction. You would have other kids that are from rich parents who... And that's, that's okay to be rich, but they, were, they, were, they sounded entitled, and they didn't want to be there, and they had bad attitudes, and it was, a, it was a difficult place to work. And I remember thinking that we were supposed to do these group counseling every night, and it's not like real group counseling because we were just staff members, but we were supposed to say, hey, how, how was today? What was the high of the today? Like, what was your best moment? What was the worst moment, right? That kind of stuff. And I remember the first time we did it, I thought, no, there's no way. These guys are not going to open up and talk about anything real. Like... I was out in the field with them. I, I've gotten to know them. They're, they're pretty tough guys. Except every time. Eventually, one person would start by being vulnerable, by talking about, man, I, you know, today was tough. I'm really angry at, at my parents, or I'm really angry at myself, or, man, I, I really struggle with this. And then all of a sudden, it would just be a floodgate of emotions, right? It would just pour in. And you would see these really, really tough guys all of a sudden start, realize, start admitting, hey, I'm not, a, I'm not all that, you know, I'm really struggling. And it was a really powerful moment and really influenced my decision to want to go into counseling because of seeing that experience and how much that the therapists were eventually able to help and how much just talking to each other was able to help. But make no mistake about it, at Capstone, what we were dealing with is we were dealing with a lot of young men 
who had to make a decision in life. That is, what brought them to that point in life? They had to make a choice. Am I going to continue that? Am I going to continue the things that led me here? Am I going to let my failure define me? Or am I going to start over again? And to put one foot in front of the other, right? That reminds me of the story of Peter. You see, Peter, we know him as this wonderful apostle of Jesus. He got to do so many cool things. Uh, Go ahead in the next slide here. Um, First of all, Jesus goes to the shore and calls the disciples. Basically says, hey, get out of the boat and follow me. I don't know about you, that sounds crazy. If someone told me, just on the side of the road, hey, Tim, drop everything, drop your family, don't worry about the job, don't worry about your kids, they're fine, just follow me. I'm calling the police. (laughs) I'm not following them. I get it. Jesus had a reputation, he had authority, and he was powerful. But man, I know people who are pretty authoritative and powerful, and I've never been tempted to drop everything and just follow them. And if you do, we usually say you're going for a cult. Yet, there was something about Jesus, and that could be a whole sermon of itself. There's something different about Jesus, right? What I want to focus on is that Peter had the faith to do it. That's amazing. Peter had remarkable faith. Peter went and said, Jesus, I can walk on water. Have you tried walking on water, guys? Uh, One step in, I'm already, I'm done. As a kid, I remember a couple of uh, really fast, very light kids who, you know, weighed nothing. They were able to get like two or three steps in. But the the point is gravity wins. And and Jesus, or Peter goes, hey, I I can do this. Of course, you know, when he does step out, he falters in faith and he falls, but he did it. He actually took an amazing step on water. Jesus confesses that Jesus is the Son of God. That was a pivotal moment in the Gospels. That took amazing faith to be able to say that out loud. Peter sacrificed everything that he had, everything that was near and dear to him for the, to follow Jesus. So I want to start by making sure you are aware, Peter had remarkable faith. And by the way, all of these pictures are from uh, The Chosen. Uh, I just, um, that's not really a a saying, it's, I'm not trying to say it's a direct one-on-one, you know, translation of the Bible. By no means am I saying that, but I am saying that it is a powerful TV show that I have found um, a lot of good things from, and also the images just really worked well for what I was doing, so I just want to throw that out there. But, um... Peter comes to this moment of life, though, and he does have his, he does have his issues with faith. First of all, he misunderstands Jesus. He, he actually refers to Jesus. Um, well, he, he, he rebukes Jesus, and Jesus says, hey, you're a stumbling block. He actually goes, Jesus actually goes so far as to say you're Satan, which is a really tough blow to Peter. But he bounces back from that, and he, even, he promises Jesus, hey, I will not deny you. I'm going to stand by you. I know you're going to die, but I'm, I'm faithful. I'm there. We know the story. He, uh, when the moment comes, he denies Jesus well, three times, right? Before the rooster crows, just as was prophesied. Now, here's what I want to focus on. Pretend for a second you don't know the story of Acts. Pretend for a second that you don't even know about Jesus being raised. Just pretend for a second you're one of the apostles. And A, the trust and the promise that you had from God, you thought he just died. And you thought there's no way a dead person comes back to life, even though they should have known that that actually was possible because Jesus did it. But that's besides the point. They're like, Jesus is gone. He's dead. They crucified him. This was all a, a play. This, was, this didn't even mean anything. And they were afraid. And they're hiding. And they're like, what am I going to do with my life? And then if you're Peter, you have one more step. You're like, man, I'm the one who said I wasn't going to deny him and did it anyway. One step above Judas, but not great. Can you imagine the headspace you would be in following those events if you're Peter? I mean, you messed up. Mom used to say when I did something really bad, she's like, well, you really did it this time. I don't don't know what that means for the other times, but I had messed up. It was going to be bad. I knew. I was like, oh, man, I don't want Dad to get home. 
Peter really messed up. He denied Jesus three times. He disowned him. He had chances to correct it. He didn't correct it. You would have thought somewhere along the way that after the first denial, he's like, well, maybe, man, I shouldn't do this. I, I promised. Je no, he was afraid. And he let his fear and insecurity and his disbelief get in the way. And yeah, we know Jesus is raised from the dead. But what does that mean for Peter? If I'm Peter, I'm terrified. I don't want to see Jesus. Do you? Do you want to see Jesus after being the one who denied him three times? Do you want to own up to that and say, hey, I really messed up, but hey, I'm, I'm here. Let's go. This is a hard thing to do. It was hard to face people I let down in my life, and I didn't do anything near that bad. Yet we find in the, in the next slide here, we find that there are really are two ways of looking at this, that we're about to read in John chapter 21 a little bit about Peter's redemption. But I just want you to think as I read that, think about the differences between two men that were around Jesus, Peter and Judas. See, we all look at Judas as the bad guy, right? Like he's the guy who betrayed Jesus. We don't have a lot of love for him. But I have to believe, and I, I do believe in God's free will, and this is an entirely different sermon, and we're not going to go there. But I do believe that Judas had a choice. I don't believe that God made Judas do that. I believe that God used Judas's choice, but I don't believe that God made Judas's choice. Does that make sense? And I believe that Judas had the opportunity and the ability to do exactly as Peter and Matthew and Mark and Luke and John, I mean, all, the, all the disciples, he could have done the same thing. In fact, we could be reading about Judas today. Except Judas not only sells out Jesus, which I would say is worse than denying, or is more like the active betrayal, he obviously feels bad about it, right? He realizes what he did. And in that moment of realizing what he did, he did the one thing he knew to do. And that is, he couldn't live with himself, and so he went and found a tree, and he ended his life. I hope that we can view that story as sad. I hope that we can view that as a wasted opportunity of someone who was in the presence of Jesus and who decided that because of his own failures and faults, he could never have redemption. And I, I want to believe, because I have read about Jesus and I know how much Jesus loves every one of us, I want to believe that Jesus would have welcomed Judas back. It might have been a hard road to recovery, <laughs> but I believe that Jesus would have embraced him with open arms. But Judas never attempted to make that choice. Whereas Peter... Yeah, he messed up. He messed up really bad. But going to John 21, 15 through 19, um, this is after, this is when Jesus comes post-resurrection. He's in the midst of his disciples, and the entire scene is a deliberate recreation of the first time that Jesus ever met Peter. When Jesus called Peter from the boat, remember? When, Jesus, when Peter gets out of the boat and follows him. I mean, down to... The charcoal fire, this is the same scene. And it's, go back to the, the verse, I want to read the verse. I, I want to read this, but I just want you to know that this is a deliberate scene. And we get down to verse 15, and it says, After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs, or feed my sheep, as also been told. Jesus told him, Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked them, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus says, then feed my sheep. I tell you the truth. When you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted to go. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. Jesus said this to let him know by what kind of death he would glorify God. Then Jesus told him, follow me. This is a really powerful scene. It's a direct recreation from the original of Jesus, of Peter making that decision to follow him. And Peter's hurt. He's hurt that Jesus continually asks this question, which I understand. I would also say that you did deny Jesus three times. 
Um, so Jesus was also hurt, but I get it. I understand the hurt and the pain of Peter. Like, you know everything, Lord. You know I love you. You know I'm back. I'm here. And Jesus says, but are you really? Are you really here? He says, do you love me more than these? And that's my favorite ambiguous word of the New Testament. <laughs> these. Scholars will debate what these mean. And I'm not as smart as the scholars are, but I will tell you, I don't think he was referring to the literal fish on the drowned that, do you love me more than the taste of fish? I don't think that's what Jesus was referring to. I don't believe that Jesus was referring to the disciples, that do you love me more than these people? That would be a problem. You probably ought to love God more than others. I think what Jesus was asking was, do you love me more than the security, the safety, the identity that you have in your old life. Remember, Peter didn't fish necessarily because it was fun. I, don't, I mean, hopefully he enjoyed it. I hope he loved his job, but he did it because he wanted to provide for his family. It was a way to make money. It was long hours, difficult job. Peter had a family. He had a community. He had just messed up to a level that was really hard for him. And he comes back and he's sitting here in the presence of Jesus and Jesus is calling all of this into question and saying, do you love me more than these? What he's asking is, Peter, I'm asking you to get out of the boat and follow me one, one, once more. I'm asking you to do a recreation of the first time. And by the way, he even says it, it's going to end in you dying. Now who's signing up for that? Because I think Peter had good intentions, but if I'm there, I'm sitting here like, Jesus, I don't, I don't know if I can do this again. I failed the first time. I don't know if I can pick myself up and, and try all over again just to result in failure. Have you ever had that fear? I think that's where Peter's at right now. And, and Peter says, yes, I love you. Then Jesus says, then feed my sheep. Then go be a leader. And the reason why we're talking about this today is because Peter did go feed his sheep. He did become a leader. In fact, tradition says it. We don't have this historically. Uh, we don't know for sure if this is true, but tradition says that he went to his death uh, about to be crucified and says, hey, I am not worthy to be crucified in the manner of Jesus. And so tradition says that he was crucified upside down. A more painful Way worse way to go if you thought crucifixion wasn't bad enough. Peter lived a life worthy of the calling. But I, I look at this story and all the components of this, and I'm, I think about us, right? Have you ever dealt with failure in your life? Have you ever dealt with weakness? Where you're like, well, man, I really, I really messed up, or I, re I really struggle with something. This is really something I is debilitating to me. This week, uh, this past week, I spent most of my days prior to the lock-in uh, sitting in front of a computer for eight hours a day doing uh, a class that I had to do. is an intensive class, and so it's one of my last ones I have to do. And it was a group counseling scenario. So I would have to hear a lecture for four hours, followed by four hours of sitting in front of a camera and either being a leader of a group or participating as a group member, right? So a leader has different roles than a group member, but a group member, we were told, hey, you've got to be a group member. Like, you have, to, you have to share. Like, you have to talk about your stuff. Like, don't go too deep, but at the same time, you can't be fake. And I'm like, well, that, man, that's, that's kind of hard. I don't know how to throttle, you know, throttle those two things, but I tried my best, and we had a really good week of, of talking just about normal stuff in life, right? One of the questions that came up was, how do we address our calling? And, and that's a whole complicated subject, but I'll say this, is that, you know, I felt called to be in ministry, right? I feel like God was moving me in that path. Except, I will also tell you that throughout my life, I made, you know, I left the church when I was a young kid. I uh, came back in my early 20s, but I had a lot of fear and insecurity about that. I went to Harding University, which is really a great school, but it had a lot of co uh, strict codes and, and different standards, and I was not really living that way, so that was a really big, hard adjustment for me. I did okay academically, but I struggled in other ways, right? 
And then on top of that, I end up getting married my junior year. We have a kid um, almost immediately. And I'm sitting here going, how am I supposed to do all this? How am I? And I kept on looking at people that were at school that I thought were better than me, that had it more together than I was. And it made me, it made me nervous and fearful, right? Can I do this? Can I actually do this? I didn't come from the family that these guys came from. Man, I don't have a great, great grandparent that was here, that was a minister at this church, right? I'm just, I'm the first Conrad to graduate from college. And I looked at myself and was like, I can't do this. And I, I was talking about this this week, and I said, you know, calling for me was weird because I never had the Martin Luther moment where the lightning struck the tree and said, oh, you got to follow God. <laughs> I didn't have something out of Samuel when God, you know, literally audible voice says, you know, follow me. I didn't have Jesus in the boat, but literally the Son of God standing on the shoreline saying, follow me. And I had to figure out. What does that look like for me? And it almost didn't happen because I almost let my own fears and insecurities get in the way. Eventually, though, I, I, I kept on putting one foot in front of the other, and I hopefully have made good choices, and I'm, I love my life, and I love my wife, and I love my kids, and I'm glad I did all of those things. But I will say that even an Oculus fear and failure is debilitating, right? It can really get in our way. This week, one of the things that happened during the counseling session is a fellow counselor in training, so someone who actually wants to do this for a living, said, she admitted, she goes, I don't like sharing about myself. And so the, uh, I, think, I forget who the counselor was, who the group leader, they said, well, why, why is that? And she goes, because I'm afraid if I share about myself anything, she goes, I'm afraid that people will see me as weak. And if I'm weak, then I'm unable to do anything I need to do. And she goes, and that would make me not a good mother, that would make me not a good teacher, that would make me not a good counselor, and she went on the list. I wonder how many of you feel that way today. Do you think that, that sharing what you struggle with or the weaknesses that you have or maybe the failures that you have in your life, do you think that somehow that makes you weak? I think all of us sometimes feel that way. And I hope you can push past that and still find a, an avenue to share, to, to be able to relate, to be vulnerable, to, to be authentic. But there's always a fear in sharing because you're like, well, what if they don't understand? Well, what if I just went too far? You know, you really didn't this time. What if, what if my struggles are too much? You know, Jesus can heal people, sure, and he can use people, but man, he can't use me. You just don't know. You ever felt that way? That's where Peter's at. Peter makes the choice to do it. But I, I think about this in my life, and I think about my family and the extended family, and I, I just started writing this list of just the easy things to do. Maybe just think through this list and think, how many times does this relate to you? Have you ever said it? I'm angry, but I, I can't help it. That's, you know. My dad was that way. My mom was that way. It's just who I am. You ever said, man, um, yeah, I, I know that I drink too much. But I can't help it. That's just who I am. That's how you know, so-and-so did it, and that's just a habit, and I can't kick it. You ever said, man, I, I don't, yeah, I don't manage money well, but it's all I know. Have you ever had a problem with, you know, maybe it's uh, relationships, whether that be in jobs or other people, and your, your go-to is, well, sorry, I, I can't, that's just me, I can't help it. Do you have a uh, relationship with your spouse, and, and maybe you do things in that relationship that's not great, and the first excuse is, well, that's just who I am, can't help it, can't change Have you ever, I think about me as a parent, I typically do the things that my parents did. It's easy to say, well, that's the way dad did it, it's the way I do it, I don't know how to change. I can go down this list and I can go down all these different things that we typically do and I'm telling you it's so easy for us to say, well, man, I, that's, just, that's just who I am, I can't help it. 
And it's almost, and this is where I want to get back to the idea of Judas and Peter, it's almost like that becomes an identity for us. Does that make sense? It's almost because of who we are. We say, well, man, I, I can't change. This is who I am. This is what happened. This is the failures I have. And we identify ourselves by those failures, by those weaknesses, instead of being willing to try again, to change, to become more like Christ. Is our identity defined by the struggles that we have? Or is our identity defined by being in Jesus Christ? Because in Jesus Christ, we are new creations. We are adopted as children of God. We are free from condemnation, as Romans 8 and 1 says. Philippians 4 and 13 says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Do we believe that? Because I really do believe that, that we can change, that we can be amazing leaders for God, that God can use us much like he used Peter. Maybe you won't have the notoriety, and sorry, you probably won't be in the Bible for other people to read about. But I think about the people here at this church. I think about this summer. This summer on the Wednesday nights, we had testimony from different people in this congregation talking to our youth. And two in particular, and I I don't think that they will mind. Um, Well, actually, I'm going to go three in particular because it's poignant for today. The first, not going to try. The first week of our summer was Kevin and Janice Appleby. And Kevin talking about the things that were the most amazing in his life and that only through God was he here. And him telling us, he started ranking the days that mattered the most to him. And, you know, I, I knew. I was like, okay, well, baptism, sure, I get that. That's always the number one, right? Um, it should be. Um, your wife, yes. Your kids, yes. And his fourth was um, being an elder here at this congregation. But he started talking about all the things that he had done in his life and, and all the problems and all the weaknesses that he had. And he's like, I shouldn't be here. And how amazing it was that not only was he here, but he has been a testament to this church. He's been a testament to our youth. He's been a testament to me. I think about Wes and Edie. And the many years of service. And if you've heard, uh, sorry, I don't know where Wes, I don't see Wes there. Okay. Uh, Brother Wes, if you're hearing this, um, I, uh, sorry, but you know, I've heard your stories. You weren't perfect. <laughs> You like to tell some colorful stories, but I'm so glad that you are, and I'm so glad you were willing to share the times where you weren't really who you were supposed to be, because through that weakness and through the faults that he had, Elm and his wife, Edie, have done amazing things for this church, and we truly are going to cry. As, as you go on to what we know is a good choice and, and we, we understand, but we're going to miss you. And we're missing you because you made a difference. Because you matter to people. Because you were able to share in your story and let us share with you. I think about those people, right? And I think about one more, and also going through a difficult time right now, is in, when David and Sherry... Uh, well, Dave, Sherry wasn't able to be up there. It was David who was up there that night, David Ard. And just talking about, again, the theme of I shouldn't be here. I made some really poor choices. I was kind of an idiot, right, as a kid. I think that was his words. He talked about the, the narrative that people would tell him about himself, that he wasn't good enough, that there was no way he could ever turn out to anything. And, he, and it's just awful that those things were said to him. I'm really glad that he chose to overcome that and to say, no, I'm, my identity is in Jesus Christ. And yes, I am weak, no doubt. But in Christ, I have strength. And David shared amazing things about him and Sherry and the journey that they have taken. And I'm just using three. Those are three stories, and I could go on and on. That was the theme of the summer. That's why we did this, is for us to be able to share in those stories and to find inspiration And so I challenge you today, just thinking about Peter and and the stories that we have is, are you willing 
to not let your life be defined by present reality, right? Yes, we are weak. Yes, we have failures. Yes, we're going to mess up again. And I, I, I started thinking about it as Peter in that moment is probably thinking to Jesus, no, I'm not going to mess up. I'm going to do it right this time. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to be the best Christian leader. Have you read the story of Acts? Peter messes up again. Peter seems to be very hot-headed. <laughs> he lets his temper and his just the way he reacts. It's not always great. But Jesus never knew, needed him to be perfect. He needed him to trust, obey, and follow him. And that's what we are called to do today. And so today, it's just as we wrap up, and of course this was meant for our kids at, at camp, but as I'm thinking about this, is I just encourage you to put on the mind of Christ. You can go a couple of slides on here. And, and that, pray to God. Find your identity in God. Change the thought patterns. This gets into counseling and some psychology, but it's also just, it's what the Bible says. And that's what's amazing about that, is that these are counseling techniques that have been actually, they're not really counseling techniques. They've been in the Bible for 2,000 years, right? And that is set your, set your thoughts on things above. That be transformed in your thinking, right? It's thinking about the things that are true and noble and right and lovely and admirable. We should not be conformed to the pattern of this world. And the pattern of this world is our de the devil trying to tell us, hey, you're not good enough. That your fears and failures and weaknesses will define you. And Jesus says, no, that's not true. If we choose to follow Jesus... If we choose to be a community of believers with each other, then we can do all things. Now, doing all things might not be the things that I want to do, right? It might not be the things that you want to do. But we can do all things to the glory of God. Meaning that he can use us in amazing ways. That he can let us transform other people through him. That we can be ambassadors and workers in his kingdom. So I hope that this message resonates with you today. I hope that uh, for whoever is in this audience, that whether you're visiting or whether you attend here, if there is something that you're going through, if there's something that's really just bothering you right now, and, or you feel like, hey, I'm not good enough, or I, I can't do this ministry, or I can't do, do this because I'm just, I'm not a perfect person. I would tell you, well, join the club. We're a church full of sinners. We're a church that I come broken just as I am, but Jesus takes us to a higher place. If you are not a part of the church, though, don't conform to this world and be stuck in that misery. Make the decision to obey Christ, to, to join a wonderful family like this that can actually be there for one another, that can encourage one another, that we can hear powerful stories like that our youth got to hear this summer. And that we can be a body that encourages one another, that truly gets to, look, to experience the peace that surpasses all understanding. And I echo what Chris said from the communion. In the meanwhile, I love the Jesus is Lord. It says, Lord, come quickly. <laughs> that should be our prayer. Our prayer should be, let's save as many as we can while we're here. But Jesus, please come. If you are not a part of the Lord's body and would like to obey him in baptism or would like the prayers of the church, you can do so as we stand and sing the song that's been selected.